Um, I would like us to take our confession. Our, our set man in the house has laid the pattern. So let's continue. In the world, they will say, let's follow existing protocol. <laughs> I want you to say after me, today, today I, will be the word of God. I will be taught the word of God. I receive the incorruptible, I receive the indestructible, indestructible. ever-living ever living. seed of the word of God. I will never be the same. I will never be the same. Ever, I'll boldly confess. I will boldly confess. My, mind is alert. My mind is alert. My heart is receptive. Heart is receptive. I am what the word of God says I am. I, am I have what the word of God says I have. I can do what it says I can do. In the mighty name of Jesus. Please turn with me if you will. In the New Living Translation, Ephesians 2, verse 10. Ephesians 2, verse 10. Ephesians 2, verse 10. New Living Translation will be better, please. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus. So we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. May the Lord bless the reading of his word in Jesus' name. Amen. What is a masterpiece? A masterpiece is an outstanding artistry, skill, and workmanship. A masterpiece is a work done by an, with extraordinary skill. A masterpiece is an original so exclusive that there is no one else anywhere else in the world. A masterpiece is the highest achievement, the greatest work of a creator. And every one of us here, we are creators. Amen. Amen. That's what a masterpiece is. The best that a creator can produce or create. And this text we have just read, Ephesians 2 Verse 10 says we are God's masterpiece. In other words, we are God's outstanding work of artistry, created with skill and workmanship. We are an original made from God, so exclusive that there is no one else like us. Amen. Amen. As believers and, and as the humankind, our identity, which gives us meaning, comes from who made us. Amen. Amen. Help me turn to the book of Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 to 27. In Genesis 1, 26 to 27, hear what God says. Then God said, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. They will reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, the livestock, all the wild animals on the earth, and the small animals that scurry along the ground. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female created he them. Notice the word male and female. There were only two species of mankind that God created. Today, people are trying to produce a third species and a fourth species. But what did the Bible says God created? Male and female. Today we have she-male. Have you heard about she-male? Female trying to be male. And we have he-female. <laughs> But the word of God says, what did he create? Male and female, he created them. Amen. 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 Our identity comes from who created us. We are made by God in his own image. I looked up the word image. The word image comes from the Latin word imagi. Imagi means exact copy exact copy. Every one of us seated here were 
a picture, a visual picture and representation of God whom we don't see. That's what makes us valuable. And that's what makes us a masterpiece. The Bible says God intended to have a people created that are like him. And remember who God is. God is a spirit, right? So every man is created a spirit. Many times we forget who we are. That we are spirits. Many of us define ourselves after the physical. And we sell ourselves short and we define ourselves short. But God says, let us make man in our image to be exactly like us. And John 4 tells us who God is like. God is a spirit. Therefore, anybody who worship God or communicate with God, in what way should they do that? In spirit and in truth. Amen. I need to unlock for you a truth. In Genesis 2 verse 7, Genesis 2 verse 7, the Bible said God, when he created the world, when he came to creating the galaxies, the sky, and every part of the universe, God simply spoke them into creation, into existence. But because God wanted to create something extraordinary, something according to his own blueprint, to be the master of all of his creation. God said he was going to create man that would be his own representative, that would be like him, that would be like him on earth. And so, when it was other creation, God spoke. But when he came to you, seated here, God did not speak to create you. The Bible said the Trinity in council, they came down on earth and out of the dust of the ground. The Bible said God intricately, delicately, with so much love, purposefully formed man. And after he had formed man, he breathed his own life, the Zoe life of God, into the nostrils of that man. And from that moment, man became a living soul, a living person. That's what makes man extraordinary. We are different, so different from everything else that God created. We are different from angels. Angels were created. God spoke them into existence. We are the only creation from God that God did not speak into existence. God formed man. God created man. God we are, that's why Ephesians 2 verse 10 says we are God's own handiwork, God's own workmanship, intricately crafted with so much beauty. God formed us and he put so much of himself into man. You will not know how wonderfully you are made until you read the word of God. David under the Holy Spirit put it in this way in Psalm one hundred and. 39 verse 14. David said, I'm beautifully and wonderfully made. And my heart knows that right well. Let me explain to you what makes you such a masterpiece. There is none like you. You are such an original that when God made you, he threw away the mold with which you were made. There is no other replica like you. You are so exclusive. You are such an original that the Bible said, well, not even the Bible has been proven by science. Your eye print, all the methods, all the means for identification for a human being, your eye print are unique to you. You know you have an eye print, so you can use your, your eyes to open a gate. Your eye prints are unique to you. Your fingerprints, your toe prints, your nail prints, your palm, all the means of identification is so exclusive to you. There are no, no elder person in the earth that is like you. Your blend, your temperamental blend, your gift set, your talent set, is unique to you. I was looking at how wonderfully and beautifully God has made me or made you. 
And I looked up some wonderful facts about we humans. Let me read out a few of those wonderful facts about humans to you. They blew my mind when I saw them. Let me read one. Are you aware that our brains are created so wonderfully by God that they say when they try to compare them to anything on earth, the human brain is like a supercomputer. A supercomputer. Our brain consists of over one billion neurons making an order of a hundred trillion con- connections. They said when they try to compare us to any supercomputer, the specifications they provided is that we have a brain that can approximately, approximately, the processing capacity of our brain. They say it's 100, 160 million computer instructions per second. 160, did you hear that? 160 million computer instructions per every second. This is the equivalent of 160, 168,000 megahertz computer. The only thing like us that is on earth is in the Pentagon. And each of those computers, they cost over 300 billion US dollars. Supercomputers. No human being uses up to a 10% of their brain capacity. You are so unique because you are created by a unique God. Amen. Amen. They said if you put wires in a human brain, it could light up a bulb. It could light up a bulb. Man is so blessed and uniquely so by God that when David said, we are fearfully and wonderfully made, every one of those words David meant them. Amen. Amen. Let me quickly run through this. Our nose can recognize a trillion different scents. Your nose, it can recognize one trillion scents. Information zoom along our nerves from our brain at a speed of 400 kilometers per hour. Scientists have recorded that every second, our body produces 25 million cells. Cells is the minutest unit of life in a human being. Our body produces every second 25 million cells. And by the time we'll be done with this service, if this service was one hour, we would have produced enough cell to outpace all the population of China and India put together, just one human being. The amount of cells you, you have created just sitting here is more than the population. India is 1.3 billion. China is 1.4. Just sitting here, your body has created enough cells to surpass the entire population of both India and China. Is God not awesome? Now the Bible says, we are fearfully and wonderfully made, and this additional fact really shocked me. Scientists have discovered that we have between 60,000 and 100,000 miles of blood vessels inside our body. And so if they are to bring out those blood vessels and lay them end to end, they said, our blood vessel, just one human being seated here, your blood vessels will travel this earth four times. The entire universe, just one human being, your blood vessels will travel through this earth. How many times? Four times. If I were you, already the facts are enough to wave my hands to God and say, oh God, how awesome are your works? 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 That inside of you, you have blood vessels enough to transverse this earth four times. Amen. Amen. Let me just speed on. We are created in God's image to be a God man. And because we are created to be a God man, this is where men take their identity from. Men don't forget what God wants us to always remember at all times, that are made in the very image and likeness of God to be a representative of God in my household. This job description does not change even when culture change. 
even when society changed. Right now, society has redefined the role of men. Many men don't understand what it means to be a man any longer. In the days of my father, it was easy to know what it means to be a man. If they say be a man, they know that they are saying be a provider, a protector, and lead your home. But now, it's a confusing question because women are now so empowered financially that many women in some homes earn even more than their husbands, right? So when the husbands enter into that marriage, they probably came into a marriage where the woman was already made. She already has children. She already has a good job. And when they say, be a man, the man wants to be a man, he says, okay, let me buy you a house. But he, he remembers, she already has a house. In fact, I'm living in the house. Should I buy her a fridge? She owns the fridge and even the food inside the fridge. Or you say, let me buy her a gift. The man buys a gift. And he overheard the woman say to her friends, he bought me a cheap gift. This cheap gift. It's now very difficult for men to understand what it is culturally about what it takes to be a man. Because uh, the women are so empowered that they really don't financially need the man. Not all women. Some women. And when they quarrel and the woman begins to threaten him, and the man says, I'm going to put my foot down, and I'll show you that I'm the one wearing the trousers. The woman says, also, I also wear trousers too. <laughs> Men, in the times we live, God wants our identity not to be defined by the world and by society and the culture of society. God wants our identity to be defined by what the word of God says. The program of God cannot be fulfilled without the, the role of a man. Amen. Amen. God has created a man to be his exact representation in the home. A man is God's secret weapon. Jeremiah 51, 20 says, we are God's battle axe and God's weapon of mass destruction. With us, God will overthrow kingdoms. Amen. Amen. Satan knows how powerful a man is and his place in God's agenda. So Satan can send all the women to church. But Satan would not want a man to go to church. Satan would prefer a man to go to Biapalo and go to club and go to uh, lunges. But he would not want a man to go to a place where he would know the truth and discover the truth about himself. Because an awakening and enlightened man is very dangerous to the, to the kingdom of the devil. And you are that man. With you, God will do amazing things. With you, God will do amazing things. So I want to outline five things that God wants you to know about yourself very quickly before I leave. Five things that God wants you to know about yourself. The first thing is that because you are created in his image and in his likeness, God wants me to tell you that you are valued. Help me say I'm valued. I'm valued. You are so valued that when God tried to describe in financial times how valued you are, Mark 9, chapter 36, verse 37, says, Mark 9, chapter 36, verse 37 to 37. God said, Mark 9, 36. Then he took a little child. Have I missed up my reference? Mark, oh, Mark 8, sorry. Mark 8, 36 to 37. Mark 8. Mark it. In those days, for what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? The next verse. For what will a man give in exchange for what? The Bible said you are so valuable because your soul is God breathed. You have the Zoe life of God, the very precious life of God inside of you. And God says, if you put all the money, all the wealth of this world together, they don't come close in measuring your value before God. God wants you to know here, even if you feel you are poor, society is telling you you are poor, that you are very valuable. Because I deal in medical tourism, I got to know how valuable human beings are. In the markets, a human being, the, the, the heart of a human being is worth $1 million. $1 million. So 
Anybody that calls himself poor, one million dollars is 750 million naira. Already seated here, your heart is worth 750 million naira. Close to your heart, your liver, your liver, yes, your liver is worth 320 million naira. Then your kidneys, that's what put uh, Equerem Madu in trouble. Your kidneys are worth 200 million naira. So seated here, we are looking at men sitting, men and women sitting on chairs that are worth over a billion. Please put your hands together for God who has made you so valuable. Help me preach to your neighbor. I am valuable. I am valuable. I'm already a billionaire. Amen. 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 You are indeed valued. And I want you to see it from God's word. In the book of Isaiah chapter 43, in verse 4, God describing your value, he used three choice words. He said, number one, you are precious. You are very precious. Number two, he says you are honored. Do you know why we are honored? Because we are raised together with Christ. And we are seated together with Christ in the place of the highest honor. At the right hand of God. That's where every redeemed Christian is seated. Where are you seated? Right at the right hand of God. Help me say I'm honored. I'm honored. Let's start from the beginning. Say I'm very precious. I'm very precious. I, am I am honored. And see the last word God used. He says you are loved. You are precious. You are what next? And you are loved. This is God's word. Not man's word. Our word does not come from what people think about us and say about us. Our word comes from what the word of God. What God says about who? About you. So remember that you are priceless. You are priceless. I want to move on to another scriptures. I want you to remember the, the scripture I want you to note about you seated with Christ is in Ephesians 2 verse 6. You are seated with Christ in heavenly places. God has made you to sit with Christ in heavenly places. Where you are seated, the Bible says it is higher than the highest. No, if you are a child of God, you are more honorable than any head of state that is not born again. You may not believe it, but that's what the word of God says. God has seated you in a place of honor that no head of state, no prime minister, no paramount ruler comes close. You are placed in the position of highest honor. God wants you to begin to carry yourself the way he sees you. Because as you begin to talk like God talks about you. You know, we confessed it before I began this message. I am what God says I am. I have what God says and I can do what God says I can do. When you begin to agree with God and make that your confession and your confession lines up, miracles begin to happen. You begin to see liftings in your life. Praise the Lord. The next thing God wants me to tell you is that he has called you his child. Help me say I'm a child of God. God. Now let's look at the implication of being a child of God. Psalm 82 verse 6. The offspring of a lion will be a lion. The offspring of a dog will be a dog. So what will be the offspring of a God? Let's see if that's what the word of God says you are. Psalm 82 verse 6. I said to you, you are what? What are you? What are you? And all of you are who? The children of the most high God. If only you wake up every morning and make this your confession. I am born of God. I am a child of God. And because I'm a child of God, I'm a man God. God has set me on earth as a God to rule over this earth. Situations bow to me. Circumstances bow to me. Because of who I am. Amen. Amen. So God has called you his child. And being called a child of God comes with tremendous privileges. Let's look at those privileges. Romans 8, 15 to 17. Very quickly. The way this time runs, and they are so frightful that it can make you sweat. <laughs> Romans 8, 15 to 17. I say to you, no, Romans 8, please. Romans 8, 15. For, for, for you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear. But you receive the spirit of adoption by whom you cry what? Abba, Father. 
The spirit himself bears witness with our own spirit that we are who? The children of God. And verse 17, see our privileges. And if we are children, then we are what? Heirs. Now, heirs means God owns the world. He owns everything. And if you're a heir of God, you're a heir over everything God owns. Did you hear that? And if children, then you are heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, then we will also do what? Now see the direct implication of being a heir of God. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 21. Because you are a heir of God and joint heir with Christ, this is your present moment reality. What does the Bible say? Therefore, let no man boast in men. For how many things? How many things? Who owns all things? And because you are his heir, what has that made you? The owner of what? How many things? So all things are potentially yours for the asking. I put this thing to a test. I and my wife had a visa to Canada and it was about to expire. And we could not afford to go on a, a trip to Canada because at that time we didn't have money. But as we read this scripture and says all things are ours for the asking. We also read another scripture in, in, in the book of First Timothy chapter 6 verse 17. It says God has given us richly all things to enjoy. So on the strength of that scripture, we asked God to give us an all-expense paid trip, and God did it. We went on an all-expense paid trip to, to the U.S. and to Canada, all expense. My wife is here as a witness. We did not go with, it is the first trip I've been to over 70 countries abroad, but this is the first time, because I wanted to prove scripture. It's the first time I traveled abroad with no money in my pocket. My wife also did not carry money, but we came back, we went empty but we came back full because God is faithful. The word of God is true. I need to really run now. So God wants me to tell you he loves you. Help me say God loves me. God loves me. 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 Now what does this mean? God wants me to tell you that the kind of love he has for you, it first started before you were born, long before he created this earth. He wants you to know that everything is for your sake. Help me touch your neighbor gently and tell him everything is for your sake. In Ephesians 1 verse 4, the Bible said before he created this earth, he thought of you first and created everything for your sake because of his love for you. He loved you before you were formed. The next scripture, Ephesians 2 verse 4, says his love for you is very great. Ephesians 2 verse 4. How does God love me? With a great love. With a great love. His love for you is how, how much? Very great. Look at it. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love, with which he does what? Loves you. So God loves you, but how does he love you? He loves you before the, he began the earth. He loves you with a great love. And that's not where his love ends. The Bible goes further. And in Jeremiah 31 verse 3, God says he loves you with an everlasting love. A love that is endless. There's a song... That they sang, Jesus, you love me so much. Oh. That's Jeremiah 31, verse 3. He loves you with an everlasting love. And in, in 1 John chapter 4, verse 16, God wants you to know. God wants you to both know and believe this love that he has for you. Everything depends on you knowing and believe, believing that God loves me. I want you to put your hand on your chest and say, I know. I know. And I believe. God loves me. He makes all the difference. He cannot withhold anything good for me. Nothing good. Not a wife. Not a husband. Not children. Not a good job. Not business breakthrough. Not cars. Not all expense pay trip. Nothing good will God withhold for me. Please put your hands together if you believe that. (laughs) Child of God, this is critical. Why is it critical? It is critical because you will come to the level and the state where God wants every Christian to operate from. God wants every Christian to operate from rest. That state of assurance that makes you not to fear. Please help me turn to 1 John chapter 4, verse 18. 1 John, I'm about to bring this meeting to a close. 1 John chapter 4, verse 18. There is no fear in love, but perfect love.
cast out fear because fear involves torment. But anyone who fears, for anyone who fears has not been made perfect in love. Amen. Amen. God wants you to know or get to the place where you say, God loves me so much that there is nothing good that he will withhold from me. Nothing good that he will withhold from me. That job in NMPC, God will not withhold it from me. That job in Chevron, God will not withhold it from me. Look, God wants you to come to a place of settled assurance that if it is good and perfect, listen, the Bible says in James 1 verse 17 that anything we desire in this world that is good and perfect, anything that is flawless, is perfect, it can come from nowhere else but from only one source and that's from God. And God says he wants you to have anything good and perfect. How did I know this? When I became born again, I thought God is against Japa. Every young man wants to travel abroad and not come back to Nigeria. Am I correct? So, it did not start now. 20, 28 years ago, when I was a young Christian, I also wanted to Japa. And I went to God in prayer. And I said, God, I cannot lie to you because you know my thoughts before I even think. <laughs> Let me tell you the truth. I want to leave this country and I'm not coming back. God said, it is his will for me to leave this country. And he showed me scripture that I did not think anything about. Do you know that God wants every one of us here to be global citizens? God says, go ye into all the nations of the earth and make disciples. If there will be global travelers, I'm, sitting there, I'm seeing them seated here. Amen. God wants to give you a world-class passport. Amen. If you have a, 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 an EU passport, you can enter 175 countries without visa. You will not apply for visa. Yes, I'm prophesying to all of you because that's the level we are coming to. Scriptures must be fulfilled. The Bible says, go if you're a Christian born again. God wants you to be a global discipler. So he says, go into all the nations. How many nations? All the nations. So I'm prophesying to you that according to the word of God, in this season we're entering, God is going to empower every member of Grace Bread. You will become global citizens. You become world travelers. God will give you first class passports, Amen. EU passports, Amen. Schengen passport, Amen. Canada pass, Canadian passport. Amen. Without applying for visa, you'll be able to enter into 180 nations of this earth. Amen. And financially, God will empower you to make it happen. Amen. In bringing this meeting to a close, because I'm seeing time up, everything God is doing is to demonstrate his love for you. He's saying that no good thing will I withhold from you. God keeps loving you and loving you and loving you until you believe, you experience, you believe, and you begin to walk in that love. To believe that God loves you and to be established and rooted and grounded in that love is for you to experience what God wants for everybody. And I'm going to pray that every one of you will experience that. Let me show you from scripture. One scripture, Ephesians 3 verse 19. God says, the moment you get to that place where you are no more shaking in this one assurance that God loves me, and because he loves me, there is nothing good that God will deny me. Nothing good. If it is good, if it is perfect, God will not deny me. When you get to that level of assurance, God says you are going to begin to experience a dimension of God that exists for every Christian. It's called living in the fullness of God. God wants you to experience his fullness. To know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that you may be what? Filled with what? The fullness of God. The fullness of God is the Holy Spirit inside of you. The Holy Spirit is God's super storehouse of all God's treasure. So anytime you are walking, you are walking with all the treasure bank. The, the central bank of God is inside of you. Your blessings are not outside you. They are already inside of you. God is waiting for the moment when your understanding will be unlocked and opened. I want you to know that you are the most blessed person walking. You are more blessed than Elon Musk. Elon Musk does not have what you have. You are the only species that can have all things. Elon Musk cannot have all things. Elon Musk cannot have the Holy Spirit. Do you know that? Elon Musk does not have the Holy Spirit. But if you are a child of God, you have what the world cannot have. You have the Holy Spirit and you have the fullness of God waiting to begin to manifest in every area of your life. In closing, 
God wants you to go into the world and begin to do the good works that he has called you for. What is this good work? The good work that God has called every one of us is for us to begin to know that God loves me. 1 John chapter 4 verse 19 tells us that I love because God first loved me. God has given so much to us. He has poured out his spirit upon us. And his spirit has poured out his love. His nature of love in us. God wants us to leave this place this morning and begin to see every unsaved child of God as a fallen image of our Lord. Because we love God, we don't want the devil to have any person that is not saved. Right? The way you demonstrate how much you love God is that you leave this place and become passionate about soul winning. You want love once another, the other, the love seeks the good, the highest good of the other person. Love is unselfish, right? Love is kind and love is unselfish. God wants us to become his instrument in the marketplace, to take his message of the gospel. What is the gospel? The gospel is the good news that there is salvation in Christ. Salvation is what men are seeking for. The blind wants to see, right? That's salvation. The deaf want to hear. The sick want to be healed. Everything men seek. Where is the answer? The answer is in Christ. And that's what the good news is. The good news says if you believe and put your faith in Christ, you will experience God's salvation. And God's salvation is the deliverance, the prosperity, the blessing that comes from Christ. Everything men seek. The answer is in Christ. And we are the instrument to connect men to their salvation. God says, would you stop being selfish today? And from this moment, begin to open your mouth and share the love of God and tell any man you meet, any woman, that Jesus is the answer. Who is the answer? As you say that in faith, you begin to see God use you mightily anywhere you go, reconciling the world and the lost back to God. I want you to be upstanding on your feet as we go before the Lord. You are God's masterpiece. And beginning from today, God wants you to go out and be a masterpiece. Being a masterpiece means I will be the best version of myself every day. I will strive to be the best version of myself every day. Ecclesiastes 9 verse 10 says in the, in the place of the death where we are going to, there is no planning, there is no work, there is no wisdom, there is no knowledge. Therefore, whatever your hand finds to do, how should you do it? Do it with all your mind. God is saying from this moment, become the best version of you every day.